So my book is called Human Errors, and this is a collection of the quirks and flaws and glitches in our bodies and our cells and our genes and our minds. And you might wonder, as my mother did, why write a whole book about that? Well, there's really three purposes of the book, two pushbacks uh, and something more uplifting and positive. One of the pushbacks of the book, well, two of the pushbacks, both of the pushbacks, are what I call the last vestiges of creationism. So creationism has been replaced as the scientific explanation for anything. Um, but some of the biases that creationism has left in our brains still infect us. Even us scientists, us skeptics, still sort of unconsciously believe a few things. One is that humans are the pinnacle of creation, the pinnacles of evolution, we'll say. The, that evolution has been this forward march of progress until we finally reach our most perfected form, which is us. Um, and I know that none of you would get that wrong like on a multiple choice test. You wouldn't say that sentence, but it does sort of infect how we view nature, how we view our place in nature, and how we view other living things uh, past and present. So I push back against this idea. Humans are not exceptional. Uh, and in fact, uh, I didn't intend to make this claim when I started the research for this book, but I do make the claim and I defend it. Humans are actually more flawed in terms of our biology than almost any other creature. In fact, now that's a, you can't measure flawedness, so I know that's an unfalsifiable statement, shame on me. But actually, I do uh, make a, a strong argument that we're actually worse in most of our biology than other living things, and I'll tell you why I say that uh, by the end. The second thing I push back against this book is that evolution produces perfection. That's another thing that you wouldn't ever say that statement, but you kind of think it unconsciously in the sense of, oh, well, if that thing exists, then it must be doing something. Or, oh, that can't really be a flaw, we just don't understand it. Natural selection would have corrected that by now. We think this way a lot when we view living things, when we view our genomes, for example. Um, and that's also just not true. Evolution doesn't produce perfection. Evolution, evolution doesn't weed out all problems. Evolution is sloppy. Evolution is aimless. Evolution is about compromises and trade-offs. And every single innovation, every single adaptation came at a cost. Right? When you gain a new function, you lose something else. And so there are um, a lot of, of things about us that are imperfections that are the result of positive adaptations, or just bad luck, we'll say, um, and they, they infect our biology. Now, the third reason I wrote the book, this is the real reason I wrote the book, especially for an audience like this, is that the flaws themselves are deeply informative. They're entertaining, they're interesting, and they tell us something about our past. And so, and I believe that understanding our past is really important for understanding our present. Hopefully that's not a controversial statement. The same thing is true for politics, right? You can't understand the politics of a region or a city or a, a country without understanding how it got there. So understanding how our bodies and cells ca came to be this way is really uh, important for understanding our biology. And it actually helps us live in better harmony with our biology, better harmony with our genes and our bodies. So that's really why I wrote the book. Uh, it tells us about our past, it helps us live a better present, and with any luck, it helps us make better decisions about the future. Now, one thing the book was not intended to be was a refutation of intelligent design. Because prior to writing this book, well, prior to it coming out, I thought about intelligent design for precisely zero minutes of my life, because who spends any time thinking about intelligent design if you're, if you're a biologist? However, once the book came out, um, I attracted a bit of attention from the intelligent design community. Now, the argument from poor design uh, goes back to Darwin himself, um, and it's this idea that uh, when you find examples of poor design in nature, that calls out for an explanation. And of course, we know the explanation is common ancestry. Uh, and so Darwin used poor design as an argument for evolution. I didn't think that argument had to be made anymore. I think we all understand evolution uh, as the reason why we're here and why we are the way we are. But the intelligent design community took extreme umbrage at my calling these various things flaws, first of all, and then that those flaws prove evolution instead of intelligent design. And I was public enemy number one from the Discovery Institute. Uh, if you've anybody heard of the Discovery Institute, they... <laughs> So um, they call themselves the intellectual home of intelligent design. A couple of oxymorons there, but let's, let's leave, that, <laughs> leave that as it is. And I lost count, um, but at one point last summer, they had written 50 articles about me or my book. 
Uh, I didn't read all of them. I read some of them. It was pretty clear to me that they hadn't read the book, um, but that never stops them anyway. Um, and so um, I found myself, so I thanked them, and I actually, I think Michael Mann said something about this yesterday. I actually really thanked them for coming after me the way that they did, because it sort of launched me into a position uh, in the proud tradition of Huxley and Dawkins of being a, a public defender of evolutionary science. And I've taken on that mantle proudly, and I'm happy to say that I led the charge against Michael Behe's new book. If anybody was aware, Darwin Devolves, his new book. I wrote a flurry of articles. I reviewed it in Science Magazine, a bunch of blog posts. We, and many others, Jerry Coyne, there are a lot of us who were in on this. We dismantled that book, and I'm happy to say 10 months later, it is a flop. It is having no influence in the biological community. Um, and so thank you, Discovery Institute, for picking this fight with me because I've enjoyed every minute of it. Um, but the argument from poor design is, an, is um, a, a lesson in common ancestry. But I wasn't writing the book that way. I was just, I was just thinking it's interesting, the flaws themselves and what they tell us about, about our past. And the errors that I talk about in my book fall into three categories. This isn't how I organize them, um, but it's important to understanding which lesson we're learning. So one category of errors in our body are the result of mismatch. What I mean is, we are now living in a very different world than the world we evolved in, right? Um, and so we are not using our body, our genes, our biochemistry in the way that it was shaped. And I, I will sometimes use the word designed, so I guess I shouldn't, but it's just, you know, fine. I'm not going to give them the word designed. They don't own that word. I can use it, and it doesn't mean intelligently designed. Anyway, but our body was designed uh, for a very different world than the world we, we now live in. Um, and I know I can sense the energy in the room. You guys are like, okay, we could use some examples. Uh, so here's the first example. Look at what all of you are doing right now. You're sitting in a chair. Chairs were not part of our evolutionary past, not at all. And this is not a correct posture with evolutionary uh, principles. And we do it all day, every day. And that has profound consequences on our knees, on our backs, and we have to get out of these chairs. Uh, they're comfortable, but it's not how our ancestors sat. They didn't sit at all, right? They stood, they leaned, they laid, they squatted. And now they spend a lot of time squatting. Can you imagine spending three hours squatting? But if you had been doing it your whole life, you would, and you'd have a better back. Uh, so our bad knees and our bad backs, our bad eyes, a lot of these things are the result of what we call mismatch. We're not using our bodies in the way that they were designed to be used. That's part of the power of this book, I think, in the sense that you can actually reclaim uh, your biology by using it in a more evolutionary correct way. But you can't blame that on evolution. You, you blame that on modern living. But it's also a lesson in the sense that every single organism is up against a changing environment. That's how adaptation works. When the body isn't perfectly suited for the way that it's living, adaptation is the result. So while this is sort of an evolutionary mismatch, it's also a lesson of how all life works. Now, we're not going to adapt our way into chairs because we don't live by the rules of natural selection so much anymore. We are evolving, but cultural evolution has way overtaken biological evolution, another big point of the book. We don't live and die based on how good our bodies are anymore, right, hopefully. And that's the uplifting part of the book. Um, another category of errors that I talk about, there, uh, I talk about in the book is what I call trade-offs. So evolution is about compromises. The evolution has the body it has, you have the body you have. Evolution can make the tiniest tweaks and tugs that's it. Evolution doesn't create whole new structures, whole new paradigms, whole new biochemical pathways. Co-opting things that already exist is really the only tool in the toolbox of evolution. And so that means every great functionality came at a cost, right? If you th birds, to use a non-human example, birds, uh, bats, pterosaurs, these are three times in vertebrates where wings were invented, right? What an incredible adaptation wings are. Three times in vertebrate evolution, but all three times, it, it didn't just sprout out of their back. Wouldn't that have been great to have new wings just grow out of their back? But evolution doesn't work that way. Evolution co-ops the forelimbs, and all of the functionality of forelimbs were lost in order to turn them into wings. They can't grasp. Uh, they can do very little with their wings except for fly. So this, we, we have those in our body, too. And by the way, this tradition of using poor design uh, to, to explain evolution, um, Richard Dawkins did it very well, Ancestor's Tale and, and Blind Watchmaker, but my book looks only at human flaws. Now, these are not, most of them are not uniquely human. We do have some uniquely human flaws, but most of them we share with apes, 
primates, mammals, and some of them, all vertebrates, have some of these silly uh, design flaws. Some of the flaws, though, are actually come down to just plain bad luck. There was no, no trade-off, no compromise, nothing was gained. It just sucks. And one example I give of that is our need for vitamin C. So vitamin C is an important dietary nutrient. You guys all know that, I'm sure. But that's actually a quirk. Most animals don't need vitamin C in their diet at all. In fact, your dog and your cat, are you making sure they get enough citrus fruit and things like that? No, in fact, that's actually not very, very good for them. Uh, they make vitamin C in their liver like most animals do. But we primates had an example of very bad luck in our evolutionary past where one critical gene in vitamin C synthesis was broken, and it was broken through mutation, and it has since been uh, littered with mutations. But we still have the gene, right? It's called GULO, L-gulanolactone oxidase, GULO gene. We have it. It's just broken, so it's like a car in a junkyard. You can see it's a car. It has all the parts of a car, but it doesn't function as a car even a little bit. So the intelligent designer almost gave us the ability to make vitamin C, just almost, but then broke the gene. Um, I, have yet to hear, I have yet to hear an explanation of the intelligent design of the GULO gene, but I, uh, not, not for lack of asking. Um, anyway, but that's just bad luck. There was nothing gained by our loss of vitamin C, uh, vitamin C synthesis. Um, it's just bad luck that it got fixed in the population. But how did it happen in the first place? You guys know the condition that you get if you don't get scur or if you don't get vitamin C, <laughs> you get scurvy, right, right. Well, how come the first uh, primate, this is common in all primates, why didn't that primate die of scurvy and take that horrible mutation with it? They already had vitamin C in their diet to begin with, right. So this mutation had no effect, right. And how did it get fixed in the population? It certainly didn't help. Bad luck, genetic drift, right? Because genetic drift is when population sizes get very small, usually because of migration, founder effects. And so just bad luck, the ancestor of all primates founded this great clade known as primates and couldn't make vitamin C. And that has restricted where primates can live for the 100 million years since. Primates cannot live in environments that don't have vitamin C naturally there. And every time they've tried, they've died of scurvy as a result. So just bad luck, nothing gained. So the way I do organize the errors in the book are in the chapters uh, that I'll show you here. So I go through anatomy uh, and all the flaws of our anatomy. Some of these are mismatched, some of them are not. Um, and most of the articles written about my book all concentrate on the anatomical ones. I'm hoping it's because people find that the easiest to relate to and point, not because they don't go further in the book. Um, but anyway. Um, so one example I have, so in a room this size, I can usually get at least one or two yeses. Has anyone here had a cold ever? So, oh, some of you have, great. Okay, so um, the common cold, as we know it, uh, uh, usually caused by rhinovirus, adenovirus, things like this. Um, you don't think of it this way, but it's actually a pretty uniquely human condition. Uh, the sniffles and sneezes, coughing, all these things that you get from the common cold really aren't shared by most of our uh, relatives. Um, and part of the reason is bad design in our face. So this is a drawing uh, by my friend and, and artist uh, Don Ganley of the largest sinus cavity in the face called the maxillary sinuses. We have paired sinuses uh, in our head. By the way, those sinuses do nothing for you. I, I, I'm in the process of writing an article now with a couple of ENTs. Um, I don't know why we have this idea that they warm and humidify and purify the air. They don't do any of that. They produce mucus, and that's it. <laughs> um, and we would all be better off without them. But anyway, how did we come, how, how did we come across this? Well, so sinuses are the result of, of most mammals being snouted. The vast majority of mammals navigate their world through their sense of smell and not sight, not vision. So your dog recognizes you by your smell, uh, much more so than by how you look. And the vast majority of mammals are snouted. You know, horses, kangaroos, carnivores, all these, they have these big snouts. And the, they, have, they use their sinus cavities to pack in millions upon millions of olfactory receptors so that they can concentrate the smell and, and really uh, navigate the world that way. Well, in primates, and then again in apes, and even more so in humans, we switched to vision as our primary way of navigating the world. And I talk a little bit about some of the pluses and minuses of that in the book. But to do that, we brought the eyes forward. Right? Because we want to see in a stereoscopic, three-dimensional world, and you really got to have your field of vision covered by two eyes to get that effect. When the eyes are on the side, you have a better field of vision, but you don't have good depth perception. So we brought our eyes forward in the evolution of primates. The problem was 
there's that huge snout right in the way. And that is right in the way if we had a snout of our field of view. So we, so through evolution, smushed up that snout way into our face. That's how we, to get it out of the way. Because we're not needed anymore anyway. You're not the, the olfactory uh, part anyway. So when we did that, just to squeeze it up into the face, evolution being sloppy and aimless had to put those sinus cavities somewhere, so they put them up in our head in various ways. Um, humans got the worst end of this deal. We have the flattest of all faces. We shoved up the sinuses. Orangutans just ditched some of their sinus cavities altogether, so they have it better. Chimpanzees have a better design than we do. Here's that largest cavity again. I'm going to return to that drawing. The maxillary sinus is right here in the front. That is the drain pipe for the mucus that is created. Now, we do have a flow of mucus, and that's designed to catch things and then send them back to our nasopharynx to be swallowed um, and, and neutralized by the acid of our stomach. That's great. What plumber would put the pipe, the drain pipe, at the top of a chamber? right? And that's where it is. That's the, the ostium of the cavity where the mucus flows um, and, okay, you can obviously see what happens is that you have, you have to fight gravity all the time. And you have little cilia that push the mucus up, but they're fighting gravity all the time, which means it doesn't take much to gum up that system, clog the, piss, the, 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 the uh, pipe, and you get pooling mucus at the bottom of that cavity. And that is a festering pool of infection. And that once it sets in, laying down might give you temporary release, but it doesn't, uh, relief, but it doesn't solve the problem. So uh, I argue uh, with, with support that the, uh, the design of our sinus cavities makes us uniquely susceptible to upper respiratory infections, sinus infections, and the common cold, and, um, and there's no upside. <laughs> and you might ask, well, again, why didn't evolution fix this? Why doesn't natural selection solve all that? That's that bias I'm talking about. Natural selection doesn't fix everything, right? The reason why natural, this is in natural selection's blind spot is you don't die of the common cold. You don't take that mutation with you, right? Evolution does not make us healthy and happy and comfortable, right? That's not what it does. Unless this stops you from reaching reproductive age, evolution is not going to do that much with it. Okay. Uh, we also have, of course, sore backs all the time, bad knees. Some of these are because we sit in chairs, but, but even more so, the problem is that we never really fully adapted to upright walking. And even some of those adaptations themselves don't make a lot of sense. Uh, so this is our back, this is our vertebral column. It's nice and neat, and it's, but it's very curvy. Why is that? Well, if you, um, the, the uh, back of our ape ancestors and, and extant apes today has this kind of sloping curve to it, kind of like a gentle J uh, shape to it. In order to stand upright, we could have just straightened it out, and there's some reasons why we didn't, but we could have just straightened it out, but that's not what we did. We created another curve. We added a couple of uh, vertebrae, but basically we created this lumbar curve, which is a pretty sharp curve there, which squeezes um, the vertebral disc, and what you end up with is what's called a herniated disc. This, this is a slip disc uh, because of the sharp curve. Um, what has you guys ever seen a, a robot that's been designed with a curvy <laughs> Uh, mainframe there. No, it would be a straight, uh, straight one would be much better for the distribution of weight. But instead we curved it, um, and that creates slip discs. Slip discs are absolutely unheard of in other apes. Chimpanzees, gorillas never get slip discs. This is a uniquely human problem, and it could have been designed uh, a lot better. Um, the most common sports injury of all uh, is the torn ACL. That's because the ACL, the anterior cruciate ligament, is doing way more work in us than it was designed to do. So as we started walking upright, we straightened our legs. Uh, most chimpanzees and other, other apes have much more of a bent leg posture, which distributes the weight to the muscles uh, as well as the bones. We straightened our legs in order to bear all that weight on twos, but the ACL did not respond to this. It didn't get stronger, it didn't get bigger, um, and, in, and in fact, it has to deal with our very large bodies, which are larger and larger all the time. Um, and there's no way to strengthen the ACL through exercise. It's this little tiny ligament that holds the entire upper and lower leg together. It's, there, there is a, a one in the back as well, but um, the ACL is doing the lion's share of the work, and it just doesn't take much to rip it. Um, okay, so that's anatomy. I also have a whole chapter on the genome. Um, I do use the word junk DNA mostly just because I like it, not because uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on the camp that all of this does nothing for us. But one thing is very clear. There's a lot of crap 
in our genome. And in fact, my research lab, I study genome evolution. I study the evolution of the human genome. And, uh, and, and particularly of late, I've been interested in how new genes are born uh, and, and evolve quickly. And, and, and uh, I have some very exciting results on that. It's not quite ready for prime time, but if anybody goes to the physical anthropology meeting, uh, I'll be talking about those results soon. They're all unpublished, but hopefully not unpublishable. Uh, but I think there, there are some exciting stuff that's going on in our genome. But the fact is, is most of our genome is crap. And more than half of it, I would say, is definitely crap. People who study junk DNA put that estimate more like 75% of our genome is purely repetitive, selfish DNA elements that do nothing for us. However, as my lab, uh, what we do, I show that sometimes you can retool some of those. But that's not on purpose, that's not by design, that's occasionally making uh, uh, lemonade out of lemons. Um, just some little quick facts, because uh, I know you guys like some juicy details. Do you guys know what percentage of the genome codes for genes? So 3% codes for genes. So you have 3% of your DNA codes for genes. Now, there's another 20-ish percent that is regulatory that helps us use those genes. But 3% codes for genes. Do you know how much of your genome comes from virus infections that your ancestors won? 9%. So you have three times more viral genes than human genes in your own genome. Uh, so you have more viral carcasses uh, in your genome than you have human genes. That's one, one little tidbit. Um, do you guys know about how many functional genes we have? Anybody? About 20,000, 21, 22,000 are the numbers that are typically thrown about. Do you know how many broken genes we have, like Gulo? At least 30,000, probably 40,000. So you have more broken genes than functional genes in your genome. Uh, if, if we're going to use the car analogy, our genome is much closer to a junkyard than a parking lot. Um, there's a lot of crap in there. Now, some of it can get retooled, but most of it is not. But we faithfully copy and proofread all of that DNA um, every time we divide. Okay, um, our diet also is just a mess. And I'm not just talking about the mismatch of we're now eating basically a carbohydrate-based diet, which we were not, never evolved to do. We, we get, globally speaking, we get about 75% of our calories from carbohydrates. That's a huge problem biochemically. Uh, we were not designed for that. But that's not even what I mean. We have a really needy diet. I mentioned vitamin C is this unique need we have. We have tons of those. Think about what you feed your dog and cat. You know, like your dog food is like chicken and rice, and that's it. And they will be perfectly healthy on chicken and, and rice. Their whole, if you ate nothing but chicken and rice, you wouldn't last a year, maybe two. Um, and think of like the, the koala eats nothing but uh, eucalyptus leaves and it's perfectly fine. We, have an, we need a little bit of this, a little bit of that, got to get these vitamins, these minerals. But supplement industry, I'm not, let's not go there. <laughs> but just in general, the only way to really be healthy as a human is to eat lots of different kinds of things. Um, I already mentioned scurvy. And by the way, scurvy is a horribly hor horrific disease, right? It's, vitamin C is necessary for collagen synthesis. If you don't have collagen, your tissues basically fall apart. You bleed out of your eyes. It's a horrible condition that uh, our, our, our uh, species has been contending with. But it's not the only one. Did you guys, so vitamin B12 is a, is a big deal um, these days because of the increase in vegetarian and vegan diets. B12 is like the one thing that vegans really have to worry about how they're getting because it's basically uh, only found in animal products. B12 uh, doesn't come, uh, cobalamin is the name of it, really doesn't come in any plant forms that are accessible, uh, that, ca that can be extracted from food. So we need B12 or else we get in trouble. And you only get B12 from animal sources. So what about all those herbivores? How are they doing it? I mean, the cows that we eat don't eat meat, and they do fine. They don't have problems with B12. We get B12 from them. Where do they get it? The pigs, everything, these are almost all vegetarian animals that we're eating. They don't have a problem getting B12, but we do. Why? Well, in their intestines, they have a bacterium that makes vitamin B12 for them, and they absorb it. That might sound familiar to some of it, some of you, because a vitamin K works that way for us. Uh, you may have even heard of vitamin K because you never can run out of it. You never need it in your diet because you have bacteria in your gut that makes vitamin K for you. Well, they have bacteria that makes vitamin B12. For, how did we lose that out on that? Why don't we have the bacteria that makes us vitamin B12 so we don't have to worry about this? We do. We actually have the bacteria that make vitamin B12. Why don't they make vitamin B12? They do. They do it all for us. The problem is those bacteria are located in our large intestine, and we can only absorb vitamin B12 in our small intestine, <laughs> which is before the large intestine in the flow of traffic. So isn't this ridiculous? You can die 
of vitamin B12. You can, you can be dying of vitamin B12 deficiency and sit on the toilet and send vitamin B12 into the toilet <laughs> rather than absorb it. Um, that's how silly our design is when it comes to this. And just so, in case your mind was going there, there has been a study. <laughs> Human feces is a dietarily sufficient form of vitamin B12, or source of vitamin B12. Hope it doesn't come to that for any of you, but <laughs> it is technically possible to get vitamin B12 out of your own feces. Okay, but so, and you know, vitamin D is another one that we have this really unique problem with vitamin D. We need a little bit of sunlight, but then we, we get skin cancer if we get too much, so then we, but then we put clothes on as we went north. We've been fighting this rickets vitamin D uh, deficiency our entire evolutionary history. Now, thankfully, we just supplement our milk with vitamin D and we've solved it, but we've been dealing with vitamin D deficiency that other animals don't either. What's the theme here? Why do we have this needy diet? Why do we need a little bit of this, a little bit of that in order to be healthy? It's because of the way our ancestors lived. They were the ultimate generalists, the ultimate omnivores. They were eating a little bit of this, a little bit of that. They were opportunistic in that way. And when evolution takes the pressure off of your body, you lose functionality. So when all of these, and our ancestors spent, spent a good deal of time evolving in the rainforest, which are just a salad bowl, a cornucopia of rich food. And then as we explored omnivory, we were adding even meat and, and, and various sources of meat into that mix. Our ancestors lived a lush life when it came to food. I don't recommend eating those foods now, but they seem to have enjoyed them. And that made our bodies lazy. When we don't have to make any of these things ourselves and get creative, when it's all being served up to us on a, on a platter, our body got, got poured absorbing these things. So I talked about our genome, talked about our diet, reproduction, uh, we, we have flaws throughout that system, too. I, I talk everything from how we make gametes, the age of, of, of sexual maturity. Everything we do re result, uh, in reproduction, we're actually really bad at it compared to other animals. That seems weird now, since there's 8 billion of us. Like, how could that be a problem? But you have to remember how recent the explosion in our population really is. We were teetering on the brink of extinction for most of our existence. And if you look at other hominins, um, a lot of them have come and gone, and they've almost like us, and yet they still went extinct. Um, and I think reproductive rates are at least part of it. Um, I talk about lots of them, but the one that I, people seem to enjoy the most um, is, is basically the one that we all know we have, is that's a problem with childbirth. Uh, and that is a uniquely human problem as well. If you look at other species, most of them, childbirth really isn't a dramatic affair. If you, there are videos of gorillas giving birth while eating and caring for other children. It doesn't look like they're, they're hardly noticing. And, um, but for us, it is. And you guys know it's because we were born with these huge heads. But it's even worse than that. Because before our heads got so big, we narrowed our pelvic, the pelvic floor area because in order to stand upright, to really do this efficiently, you have, your legs have to go straight down and they have to be nice and tight. Have you ever seen a chimpanzee walk on two legs? They can do it, but they kind of swing their legs like this, right? But we straightened up and we have this nice striding gait. Our center of gravity doesn't bounce around pretty much at all. Um, so if you look at a chimpanzee, uh, human, adult human, uh, female, uh, adult female pelvis, uh, and and the, the size of the cranium, you'll see no, no problem. However, once we started walking upright, things got a little dicey. So this is the um, uh, Lucy's uh, pelvis, Australopithecus afarensis, and you can see the size of the cranium uh, at birth. Not that different than chimpanzees, but the canal got a lot smaller. Well, then our brain got really huge, so, so the narrowing of the pelvis happened first, then our brains got really big, and this is an adult female human pelvis and cranium at birth, and you'll notice if you're thinking that doesn't fit, you're, you're on the right track. Um, childbirth is, an, until recently, until modern medicine, childbirth was the most dangerous thing that an adult uh, human ever did. Uh, and in fact, between 10 and 20% of birth events probably in, resulted in the death of mother, baby, or both. So this is an incredibly uh, awful experience. Uh, it's an example of evolution pulling on both ends of the rope because narrow pelvis is good, big brains are good, and here we're stuck in the compromise. What was the compromise? is humans are born way too early. We cut gestation short in order to get things out while we still could, but, but human infants, because of that, are born incredibly incapable. Um, and in fact, infant mortality in humans before modern medicine uh, was greater than 20% in the first year because we're just not fully cooked. We are born way too early. Uh, and because of that, we need an incredible amount of parental care, really for about 30 years. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's the best that joke's ever done. Um, <laughs> So anyway, uh, I go through all the, the whole reproductive uh, cycle, uh, finding inefficiencies. I talk about uh, various human diseases. Unfortunately, I don't, I'm out of time, so I can't go into those. Uh, lupus, for example, uh, what a weird disease that is. Our, our immune system just attacks itself, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, and then uh, we also have a lot of flaws in our minds. Uh, these are called cognitive biases. The mo most of what I talk about are, co are called cognitive biases, where we will make the same errors in judgment over and over and over again, even when we have all the information. Um, this, I used to have to convince people that we have flaws in our minds, but since the election in 2016, this, you know, I usually can <laughs> breeze right past this one. And I, I, that's, that's a joke, of course, but it's also true in the sense that the one thing evolution has never rewarded a species for is self-restraint, discipline, forward-thinking generations ahead. Evolution has never rewarded a species for that, right? And so that really, if you just map that onto all the decisions we're making as a people, it makes perfect sense. Um, thank you very much for your time. I've had a great time at this conference. I can't wait to come back. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and ring that bell to be notified about new videos. You can follow us on social media, and if you really love what we do, consider supporting us with a donation. Links to all that good stuff is in the description below.